Hey, Eli, yeah. can you grab that, that jar that's on the floor right there and bring it? Um, so, uh, before I start making the announcements, I, I, I wanted to talk about what, what we're trying to do. And uh, because of the rain and because of the way that these guys' presentation is, we're going to do the whole thing in here so we don't have to split the group up and go into two different places. So we're not going to make you move around like we thought we would. But here's what we're trying to do uh, with this presentation is to have y'all closer to Steve and Brendan and have y'all more able to ask questions, see what's going on, pass things around, touch, feel. Uh, we kind of want, uh, want you to be part of the presentation. So feel free to ask questions and just be involved with this. And we're going to let it take its own shape as we go. And we wanted something a little less structured than what we did in the past. So that we, we, they can take it whatever direction y'all want it to go. So don't be afraid to just be a part of this. Good? Raise your hand. Amen. Yeah, there you go. Amen. You don't have to raise your hand for me, just yell. <laughs> okay, I've got a couple of announcements. There's some stuff coming up that fishing-oriented people should know about. Number one, this weekend, how many people here fly fish? Oh, more than I thought. Okay, that's cool. If you, if you are getting into or thinking about the sport, we have some classes that we're going to teach them once a month, and they're coming up this weekend, and we have some spaces open. Fly tying, if you're interested in learning to tie your own flies, even if you want to learn to tie sock leg jigs, if you come to our fly tying class, you'll learn all the basic techniques that will get you there uh, to tie that type of jig. So fly tying class, we have a few spots open this Saturday morning. If you just want a kind of a general overview of fly fishing, like learn about the rods, the reels, get a, some basic casting kind of instruction, nothing in depth, but just basic casting, we have fly fishing fundamentals that'll be at two o'clock in the afternoon uh, on Saturday. So it's kind of a double header. If you're interested, get on our website and sign up. Uh, the fundamentals is pretty tight. There's only a couple spots left to fly time and we have room. Okay. You don't have a fly time happy hour. We, I'm so glad you brought that up. <laughs> uh, in fact, we just put that up there today, right? Uh, I just put it on mine today. But uh, we are do, we have a fly tying happy hour. It's a new event that we're doing for the first time Friday, March 22nd. So that will be three weeks from tomorrow night. And what it is is uh, if you're a fly tire, just come, hang out, tie flies, maybe watch and see what other people are tying. Learn something from somebody else. If you're new and just you're curious and you would just want to come and watch people tie flies, that's great. The other good thing is Abita has donated beer for that night. <laughs> so that's that's one much better. Sorry, guys. I, sh I, I wish I could have gotten beer for tonight. That would have been better. But uh, but if you come to fly tying happy probably hour. probably why there's less people here. Too. <laughs> <laughs> if you come to fly tying happy hour, uh, you will have beer here. So that's, a, that's coming up. You can check our website or Facebook for that. Um, okay, last announcement, um, and I'll pass these around. How, how many people here have been to Beer and Gear? Okay, a lot of y'all. If you haven't been to Beer and Gear, uh, it is, we bring in industry people from all these brands, and they set up out here, and they all bring beer from wherever they're from in the country. There's an amazing selection of beer, and, they, and you walk around, you talk to reps about Hobie, you talk to reps about fly rods and talk to reps about all kinds of things and in each booth you say what kind of beer do you have oh that's great i'll take one so uh also this has not been announced this is the first item actually putting it out there we're going to give away a 2019 hobie outback that night so somebody will walk away with 2019 hobie outback that night all right good any questions <laughs> to get us prepared for the next day, which is demo day at Vermilionville. And if you want to try out kayaks and come uh, come check them out. So we'll have all the 2019 uh, boats out there. Um, all right, any questions on my part? Okay. So uh, by way of introduction, a lot of you, how many people have come to this seminar before? Or let me, let me put it the other way. How many people is this your first time to come to a seminar? Look at this. Okay, that's nice. awesome. So well over half the crowd, this is your first time. Uh, Steve and Brendan have been gracious enough to be coming here for how many years? Man, like five or six years at least. Eight years. Eight years? Okay. It's been a long time. They've come here every year. 10? 2011? 11. It might be.
I think it was my first year. <coughs> I think I came two years before you. Yeah. And so. Yeah. It's been, they've been doing this for a long time. It is so, uh, so helpful uh, because these guys, number one, have the fishing knowledge. And number two, unlike many people, they're willing to share it. And uh, that is just, that's an unusual combination. But uh, they're both involved in Bay, Bay Coast Kayak Fishing Club, uh, also involved in Black Kayak. In, anything kayak fishing oriented, these guys are pretty much involved in it at all levels from local tournaments to world championships. Um, but usually John gives Steve a couple of beers and he shares a whole lot more. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight, he might be more tight-lipped, but we're going to loosen him up. So um, anyway, we're, uh, we're glad y'all are here. We appreciate y'all coming. And uh, this, is a, this is a big deal for us. And both of these guys are on the Hobie team. And, and being here is part of their Hobie team commitment. And uh, you know, I, I also want to thank Hobie for, for putting this on and supporting these guys to help support us. So it all comes around. So what we're going to do, we're going to pull some names. And uh, we have three Hobie hats. Two Hobie fishing towels and a Hobie buff. So this is what we're gonna do. What, if we pull your name, you raise your hand, and we will attempt to throw the item to you. <laughs> and that's the most entertaining part. All right, you ready? All right. Pull. First name. Except for this hat, red hat. Sean Rogers. Yay. Oh, oh. <laughs> Big John. Oh, yeah. I don't think I can throw that. Yeah. Oh, look at that. <laughs> okay, it's for the orange hat. This is Mike Carlin. Hey, there you go. Congratulations. All right, we're gonna give away the two towels next. These are easy to throw. Tommy. Tommy. <laughs> Tommy P. Tommy P. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> okay. And for the first time, you're not an employee here. Ricky so Smith. <laughs> Ricky Smith. Uh, congratulations. And for the Hobie Buff. Jason Leonard. All right, Jason. Nice. Okay, good. Well, um, again, <laughs> let's give these guys just a round of applause for <laughs> you up and put half the group in the outpost but uh since steve has a little bit of a powerpoint we're gonna we're gonna just kind of play it by ear here there's some good seats down close if you want to get yeah. in a lot of this stuff is real small and yep get close there's two good seats here one here and jump in yeah get up close setting up and all that um, we can talk so who fishes tournaments a lot of you guys tournament fish who just recreational fishes all of us and the thing about our presentation is really yes we talk about strategies we talk about things that help make your tournaments more successful but really it just ties things together for general fishing that you can use all the time. So uh, take all that out of it, that it's not just for tournament fishing, it's also for fun fishing, and just all this lifetime of information that we have that we can share with you guys. And likewise, we definitely pick up pointers from you guys as well. All of fishing <coughs> is uh, a never ending uh, study. All right, so um, give Eli just a second here. Whenever you're ready, go ahead. Um, <laughs> that was our intro there. Uh, reading the water is our first subject. So a lot of times we get that question. Man, where do I go? What am I looking for? What, are you, what you're looking for on the water has a lot to do with all these different conditions. So we have fronts. Uh, you have summer fronts, you have winter fronts, you do have fronts at different times of year, but primarily your fall, uh, winter, and spring is your front time of the year. And uh, in the summer, it's storms, lightning, and those sort of things. Well, weather is a big thing. Uh, tide is also one of the other key 
factors. Uh, water clarity is always something obvious. You, you launch, you go to your, one of your favorite spots and it's all muddy or it's, it's gin clear and the sun is high. You know, those are two things you're not really looking for. So, uh, and then seasonal patterns. Where do you expect the fish to be? And uh, you know, this year it's kind of warm and we kind of had a surprise that a lot of trout were down at the coast. Uh, kind of seemed like they were uh, a little mixed up, but we did have a lot of fish down at the coast. Some of the guys down in Coast Street were catching real good out at the islands, out at the rigs, some of their summer spots. Some of the guys down in Grand Isle, same thing. Some of their summer spots were really doing well. But this is kind of an unusual year, and um, uh, so you may venture down there a little sooner than normal. All right, so the first thing that I like to look for in the formula that I'm gonna to put together in my head, okay, I'm going fishing, what is the weather? That's the thing that we're always gonna look at. So I took some screenshots here of how you can see how the temperature, barometric pressure is that black line, temperature is that red line, and wind is the bottom. And you can see how these lines make this together and apart together and apart pattern. That is this week. This is this week. This is the forecast for Grand Isle. Just pick something common, you know. And you can see that what starts the system, the lines tightening up, is that west wind. And that seems to be true throughout the front season. When that west wind starts blowing, it starts pulling those lines together. And when that happens, barometers skyrocketing, <coughs> temperature typically is going to be falling and those are the things right there that, that trigger fish to want to shut down but you do have little windows and there's a small window very early in the morning just before that W of an hour. That might be the early bite day. I need to get on my fish, I need to get on them early, I know the wind's coming, I know the barometer's going to be rising. I can see it. Where's that W you talking about? Uh, down there at the bottom on the wind, see it says 12 miles an hour from W, from the west. And all these lines move around. Right now it's just the fronts are all over the place and the winds are moving all over. This week is a little rainy, but this pattern is pretty consistent throughout the whole fall, winter, spring, really kayaking season. In the heat of the summer, we'll kayak in the morning, but if it's 100 degrees out, we typically aren't out there at 2 o'clock unless we have to, right? So um, this is really, really important to understand that when that west wind starts blowing, it signals a major change. Um, it is the start of the front cycle. Uh, what do we find? We find uh, dirty waters are predominant problem that's going to be coming in. Water hasn't dropped yet in temperature, not quite yet. It's going to drop, but it hasn't dropped quite yet. And when that west wind is rolling and you have a predominantly east flowing tide, what happens? It rolls. So you have that rolling effect, and that's why you get your dirty water. Uh, things you can do to counter that when it's that west wind is first coming in. One of those is to try fishing your lee leeward shore lines and fish near your fish highways. The fish know that from contact with the fish or you're more likely to come in uh, contact with the fish there and you will 500 yards back up on a flat and the west wind's been blowing for four hours. You're more likely over there closer to the drops. That's where points come in. If you have a point, point can be great. You got a little dirty water on one side, a little clean water on the other. The point on one side drops off. That's one of the best times to fish points on the leeward corner. Um, large lures can be a big, can pay off big here. That west wind, everything's noisy, it's wavy. Uh, and a big lure makes a lot of a big presentation and you're overcoming the waves, the wind, the dirty water and they know they might want that one big meal before they're going to go and sit for three or four days. Uh, so that's 
also a time when your your corks uh, like that. Everyone likes the four horseman cork now. Real popular. Anybody use that cork? Uh, makes a lot of noise. People say, "Oh, it'll outfish any other cork." Well, I can tell you that from my experience, it has a time and a place, and that is when this kind of condition is starting is when it, I think it does the best. Not saying it won't work any other time. I just think this is when it does the best. On the contrary, your little tiny small oval corks, you have those foggy mornings, I guarantee you will outproduce your big old goosh, goosh corks. You know, you have your foggy mornings, you don't want to spook them up. You want your little quiet presentation. So there's a time and a place, and I think this part of the front cycle is when that happens. Sometimes when a west wind is socked in, that's about all you get. <laughs> Once it's in and the water is chocolate milk, you know, sometimes the fishing can just be awful. And uh, you can just get what you can get. You know? uh, fish get cold too. That's something that I think about. Uh, so when you have north wind, the wind cycle comes back around. Full uh, north wind is blowing. You have your water temperatures dropping. Your metabolism in the fish is going to slow. Uh, things you can do to counter that are fish slow moving water. Fast moving water, after the water temperatures drop, say eight degrees or 10 degrees, is usually not that productive. They want that slow, dead in canals, uh, slow, slow stuff. The metabolism's falling, downsized lures, um, sometimes you can lighten up that line too, and this is the time of the year to do that, or the time of the front cycle to do that. This all has to do with what water I'm looking for. Alright, and this is the result after that wind. Can be, you know, you can see this. We've all seen this. A lot of people post it. Oh, my bayou, especially Sycamore Point. Everybody, we always take pictures. Uh, uh, the guys on our on our Hobie team, Doug and Butch, and every they'll go to some more point and take these pictures of just the water, uh, 200 yards away from the beach. You know, uh, once it gets like that, man, that's where you definitely want to focus on those still, quiet, deep places where you can get to them. East wind, yeah, east wind is not always the best; it can be the least. And what I mean by that is. In the front cycle, I didn't capture the west over there on the far, far left. I captured it over here on the right because it was a better, it was easier to see. Well, we've, we've gone from west to north, and now it's starting to turn around to the east. And almost every time when the east wind just starts to blow, see, here's where we're mixing with our east and northeast. We got 21 mile an hour east northeast. Where is our barometer? The highest of the entire front cycle. It is almost always going to be at its peak when we hit that east-northeast or that east wind. And uh, that is a really terrible day to fish. But you can counter that day by checking that barometer and, and you can look at it and you can see towards the afternoon it starts to make a dip and that might be a good afternoon bite because the barometer does fall I didn't show it on the next slide, but it does fall towards the afternoon. So it might be an afternoon bite. You've gone like a day and a half past the front, and man, they just now starting. Might be an afternoon. Uh, wind starting to come a little bit round more to the east. So that's how you can counter this type of weather. But it, this is the toughest uh, pattern to fish right here. Uh, high pressure, um, protected water with some depth. I don't like to fish protected water that's shallow when you have super high pressure. I like it near deep water or slight, you know, have some depth. Why is that? Super high pressure fish, what do they do? Most of the time they're gonna suspend. When they suspend, that is one of the reasons they're so hard to catch. Your normal tactics aren't working. They're sitting there in the middle of the water column but they're, you're going to be looking for that deeper water, and that's where they're going to, they're going to be. Um, suspended lures. Brendan's going to do a nice presentation on all the different types of suspended lures. Uh, soft plastics that sink super slow. 
uh, some of these tactics, this is a really good time to use these. It doesn't mean on the east wind you can't catch fish. You just really can change your tactics a little bit and you still can put fish in the boat. Uh, dead stick, that's another technique I like to do uh, where you take, um, for example, you can take a Z-Man, that straight tail Z-Man plastic, drop it down where you know you think you have some fish, maybe you've located them with your fish finder, and let that thing sit there. The Z-Man will float. You'll have it on the bottom, barely move it. Also, uh, your, uh, your little John, things like that. And this, the tactics can make the biggest difference on a high pressure day. Uh, that was towards the afternoon. We didn't catch anything all day. Remember that trip, Doug? We, uh, we really struggled all day. The wind had just started to come around towards the afternoon. It was super flat along these grass lines. And uh, just as it started to change that afternoon, fish pulled up on those flats and we started catching food. Southeast wind, call in sick. <laughs> there is no better time. So there's a lot of rules out there. Fish three days after the front. Really, it's fish when that southeast wind makes that turn. When it makes that turn, here we can see everything starting to level out. Our barometric pressure is below 30.2. We really want it below that. We don't want it. 30.3 is, is, can be awful fishing. 30.2, 30.1, once it starts hitting that range, then you get into normal range. And uh, you can see that temperatures are normalizing, wind is light, and if you noticed uh, today when we got up we had some fog, those are the type of mornings you start getting a little warm wind off of the gulf, but the water's still cold, boom, there's the fog. That's usually a couple days after your fronts. Uh, you have um, stability, and that's what we're looking for. Uh, once that southeast wind just makes that turn, or you're at the end of the east wind, uh, stable barometer, water starts to clean up, uh, rising water temperatures. And this is the time when, hey, this fish may have moved back up on those flats, and then I'm going to follow. So getting deeper in the flats, that's the time to do that. I'm not going to be jigging the deep channels. Uh, this particular day right here, that's exactly what happened. We had, the weather was coming around, it was warm enough, that afternoon light hit, and it was just on. So uh, we were fishing shallow flats, but uh, even though it was cold, the water had risen just a few degrees. We had about a two degree rise, and that's all it took, boom, no fish, fish water. Time of year. Um, you definitely want to look at times of the year that are your peak times if you're a if you're a tournament fisherman doesn't matter you go when the tournament is but if you're going to take take somebody you know you want to have that fun trip you want to repeat some trips that you had in the past mark that calendar make a mental note uh, and you know like a lot of guys here how many fish uh, turkey trout one thing about that tournament that's just classic, we're on the fish, or on the fish, tournament comes, they're gone. It seems like that front that hits late, late November, early December can just wash them out of there. But right up before that, it's usually fantastic. So there's a period in there we know that that place is typically good. Uh, normally it's the first three weeks of November, maybe the last week in October, somewhere up in there. That four week period is typically fantastic. Other times of the year are also great for other spots. Uh, springtime is travel time. You're going to have wind, bleeding wind. You get sick of it. This is the time of the year where your fish are going to be migrating. They're going to be scattered. They're going to be on the move. You're going to have fish in the marsh exiting. You're going to, especially trout, your redfish, um, 
you redfish are going to be starting to establish where the grass first starts to grow and they're going to move off the oysters where they were in the winter onto the grass. As the grass starts to grow in the ponds, they're going to start migrating towards those. In the winter, they're more on oysters. So in the spring, as your fish are scattered, it is time to blast and cast and you, you find your coves, you find your areas that have that, I call the right ripple. It's a ripple where, and, and it's, it's something that we look for, man, you just got that small amount of wave action going on. Not that slick flat shoreline typically, although you can catch them there occasionally. There's no set in stone rules when it comes to fishing, but that nice little ripple you find is just perfect where you can cover it with a top water or um, a swim bait or something and, and you catch a couple of fish on it, move on down, come back an hour later, hit it again, you might catch another one or two. But you know, springtime is not necessarily the time where you're going to sit in one spot and live it out. It's the time where you got to stick and move, you got to move. And then you can match the hatch. Uh, what I mean by that is look for signs of a first brown shrimp to start popping. When they do that, you know, that is the time of the year when the little shrimp imitations work great. Voodoo's, things like that. I, I think that's my favorite time of the year to use those little baits. And uh, I didn't talk about color, but uh, color can make a big difference. If you have stained water, sometimes you want your golds, <coughs> a little bit brighter colors. Uh, Let me throw on one thing too. Mm -hmm. uh, in the springtime, <coughs> One of my favorite things to do that works for redfish well is to fish the windward side of a big pond. I think when all the bait comes in in the spring, it's, it's really small and that, that wind just pushes them on a bank. And if you get into a pond and you're fishing all the nice comfortable places, don't forget to go throw at that, that place that's getting pounded on the side because you throw some baits and all the redfish are there because all these little shrimp and all these little pogies, they can't fight all that wind and it's just stacking them all over there and they're just getting mauled and you can't tell because it's all rough over there. But it's really rough because there's a bunch of fish under the water and they're all tearing it up and you throw your top water over there and you're like bam, bam, and you catch like five in a row. Don't forget to throw it those rough spots. Absolutely. Summertime, some of the obstacles we have when we're looking over our uh, area that we're gonna fish is uh, the heat and storms. So when it comes to heat, we may take into consideration some of our favorite ponds may be good for the first hour or two. So you really need to go early. Uh, if you're in a tournament, you might, it might play a big part in your strategy. If, let's say it's a slam tournament, you know, it might not be the best thing to go for uh, your favorite pond redfish at 10 o'clock. It might work out for you, but it might be a good idea to pass by there take a couple of shots early while those redfish are active and then peel off and keep on going for your maybe your longer spots. Uh, when it comes to storms, uh, as the storms are coming in, you don't want to get caught out there and all that, of course, but uh, as the storms are coming in, if you have a high barometer and it starts falling because of that storm, man, that is a key time when pay attention to what the fish are doing and sometimes they'll tell you hey I want a different lure chunk of top water in the middle of the day if you see that you feel that barometer falling feel that wind starting sometimes they'll just all of a sudden start blasting top water where they didn't touch it before uh, moving water is cooler has more uh, has more oxygen uh, a little bit of movement in the summer is good and um, uh, Sometimes your trout in the winter are going to totally avoid you moving the currents and all that. But in the winter, I mean in the summer, they're going to gravitate towards that. They can post up on spots, they'll get down in the thermocline, get down to that cooler water, and then the bait will be washing right to them. Uh, find the right bait, and what I mean by that is as you're searching the water, you're scanning and you say, man, I see these pogies. They're Pogies are a good thing, right? Oh yeah, pop, 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 pop. And then you just see them in a pond or an area or a bay and they're just pop, 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 all over in a big group like an acre. It's typically terrible. There's no predators underneath them. They're just in there just flopping around like they're having a good time. What you want to see is you want to see them bunched up and you want to see something blasting through them 
or you want to see them next to a jetty, really tight, flashing. Uh, I don't like to see pogies that big. I like to see them that big. Uh, mullet. Mullet is a general term people toss around. Hey, I found some mullet. I like to see finger mullet and small. I like the small variety. If I'm seeing these big jumping three footers, they're just like on vacation. Ooh, you ever see them skying? And they're just having a good time all around you. I mean, that sometimes is the worst places to try to fish, but if you find your finger mullets, especially on corners, and you see them dart around like a shark went through them or something, that's what you're looking for. So find the right bait, not just any bait. Uh, incoming, uh, incoming for trout, outgoing for redfish. That's been the rule of thumb for a long time. Uh, fallen tides are really great for redfish, dumping everything out. They'll get up on your key spots and man, you can hammer some redfish. It's a lot of times in the afternoon anyway, your incoming tide sometimes will be in the morning and uh, your trout will be up on the flats when that flat is flooded. And that is, uh, it's been a rule that's just a general rule, but it's worked well for us. Incoming tide on the beach for trout for sure. If I'm fishing in the marsh for trout, I want the flood tide right as it starts to fall. That's that's my preference if I'm picking, but I so never you pick. You schedule your day based on what you see. So if you have that information, you say, well, I know that the, the high tide is going to be here, then you can schedule your trip around that tide cycle. Here's a beach shot. We just talked about the beach. And what we have here, this nice little feature, is there's a beautiful trough. So we have the waves out here breaking out on the sandbar. Maybe a beautiful trough right behind it. And then we have like a secondary sandbar. That trough is just really key to locate on any beach that you fish. That can be golden in the morning. Really have some uh, good opportunities there. Uh, fall is for catching. Uh, I don't know hardly any trout fishermen that, especially people that like to fill a box. You know, this is the time of the year when you can really catch a lot. Uh, you do have um, you do have some west winds as the front cycles begin. You do have water that will get dirty in the fall, but it cleans up pretty quick. Uh, so looking for clean water, that's another rule of thumb. Everybody says, look for clean water. You know, well. Clean water is probably the most important, I think, in the fall. I really look for that. And uh, school and bait, finger mullet, menhaden, or pogies. Uh, you find that school and bait, this is the time of year where you're typically going to find uh, it's bull reds behind them, or you're going to find, which are fun. You know, we do some tournaments with bull reds, uh, especially you catch foot or release tournaments. We have our IFA coming up. Uh, school and bait fish. Uh, Doug and I were on a trip. We found some school and pogies, and uh, man, we just smashed them. <laughs> uh, many With tide the lines. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> many tide lines. So that big old huge curling around tide line that's going right through the middle of the bay. A lot of times you'll find catfish on that. But it's those little mini white ripples in the interior marshes that are just really good. You'll have that clean water on one side of it. Small little mini tide lines are uh, a key thing. When you scan in the water, you look around, what is good over here? Oh, I see something there. Mini tide line. And uh, fish the highways. That's always a good thing in the fall. They're coming in. It's a good chance you're going to intersect some fish if you're uh, in those zones. Uh, schooling pods, this is the time of the year when you find a lot of uh, schooling fish. Uh, redfish falling up, they'll come out sometimes out, they'll be in the middle of the pond blowing up on bait. Shrimp is all being pulled off the grass and it's in a big whirlwind of a big smorgasbord and the reds are just all in it. You can see the shrimp popping up everywhere and the reds are all cruising with their heads kind of out of the water a little bit. It's fall, it's glorious. Yeah. Be sure you're on the water. Yeah. <laughs> Take a vacation. <laughs> Winter kayaking wonderland. So uh, it can be a challenge, but it can also be the time of the year when you fill that box. You're a tournament guy. Winter can be the time where uh, you can't separate yourself from other guys too. And, and 
fishing these patterns that we talked about. Uh, I've seen so many tournaments where man, a guy's out there on a windy point who's just, well, I caught him here before. Well, uh, the water's 48 degrees and you're fishing three foot of water and there's a nice little canal here with 15 foot in it. I would probably be fishing over there instead of on the, the same spot you caught them in the fall. You know, they, they're not going to stay in the same. A spot is not always the key. It's the migration. It's a flow up and down on the shelves. And if you can get that, find, get familiar with that in your areas, uh, you really can do well. Feet poles near the feeding flats. Uh, leeward shorelines, protective water during the warm period of the front cycle in the winter. Yes, they will go shallow. You can find trout in shallow water in the middle of winter. But I find that they're near those drop-offs. They're not going to travel miles and miles and miles, way, way, way back up in some spot when they have a, a hole that they're getting into when the front comes back around. Well, I would classify the winter into two halves. The first half of the winter being the time that it shocks the fish, like when those fish go from that 70 degree water to that first time that the north wind comes in and it blasts and it's 30 degrees and that water plummets, they all freak out and they all kind of pool up in those deep holes. But as the winter goes on and the norm is to be at 50 degrees, then those fish kind of get used to it and they start spreading out so you don't find the concentrations that you did at the beginning of the winter at the end of the winter and so fish kind of uh, you know get used to it if you will acclimate so you might go out you know at the beginning of the winter and uh, the temperature might be 55 and there is it used to be 70 degrees two days ago they're not going to bite top water but you go out in the winter in january february it used to be 48 but this whole week it's warmed up and it's 55, they're smashing top water. It just, they get used to it at the end of the winter, so don't think of winter as one period. Kind of adjust your uh, frame of mind when you're thinking about it. And that's where that relationship too really helps too, is to think about your holes versus your flats and how far apart they are can make a difference. Um, travel early, fish late. Hey, if you have a two degree rise in your water temperature, um, it can make all the difference in the world. And uh, it's time of the year basically to sleep in and, uh, and go out and uh, go in the afternoon. Never sleep in. Go out in the afternoon and kill them. But if you fish in a tournament, it can be a good strategy to make your travel early if you know you're going to have. Uh, 47 degree water in the morning and man, I think it's going to warm up four or five degrees today and I'm going to go ahead and travel now and get to my good spot. I'm, that's when I'm going to make the run. And um, if you find them, stick with them. Typically your winter fish are bunched up more and um, this is the time of the year when you catch a lot in one spot. Dead in canals, of course. Uh, here's a tide cycle that helps the uh, South Louisiana sportsman. It shows one of the worst things that you can have, a four tide day, the 22nd to 23rd. Uh, we try to never schedule a tournament if we have any control over it on a four tide day. But, uh, um, does happen occasionally. I mean, you can be pre-fishing on a four tide day. I don't know why they didn't bite. But four tide days are, are awful. On the ninth, we had a two tide day. This what do we have? Point three. I mean, almost no movement at all. So the ideal is going to be uh, somewhere around that stability area where you have a good amount of movement, and that movement is going to intersect good weather pattern. But if you only got a Saturday to fish and it happens to be on that day and maybe it's the wind's been blowing from the south for three days and then you know that Louisiana's tides are a little bit wind driven because we only fluctuate, you know, this much or whatever. So that wind can account for, you know, this much of tide movement if it wants. So think about the wind too, because just that without the wind is, I mean, we've had tournaments on a flat day and then the tide's like rolling through because you know, the wind drives a lot of it. So 
when you think about the area you're fishing like uh, a sponge on a plate of water and you blow it and then that water kind of builds up against that that wall of that sponge that's the marsh and then on the other side it, it might stack against that side so if you're fishing in an area and you look at it you know okay i got a roadway here i got an east wind it's going to stack this water against this roadway and on the other side of this road it might be two foot low you know so just think about the wind when you're planting tides especially on days that you get disheartened because there's no tide there might be still some movement there you definitely need water movement if it's like dead calm and it's not the winter when you're fishing a dead end canal you need know. So it's, it's one of the factors to uh, take into consideration. And what we're trying to do is uh, give you pointers on how to put together patterns, how they work. How, man, I caught them on this day really well. Why? And then you look on these these tools that we're giving you, and you can put the, put the uh, all the factors together and say, well, I understand. I had a really good tide this day, and the wind was working with it, and this and that. And, you know, you can understand why something happened. Or if you had that bad day, you can also use this. If nothing else, we can use it as a great excuse to say, you know, hey, I didn't catch anything today, there's no tide. <laughs> or if you're in the middle of the pass and the tide is coming against the wind, and then it just creates these stacks. giant stacks yeah. that you don't want to be out in the kayak in. Right. Uh, water clarity. Uh, water clarity is, uh, this is just a good little example here of, how sometimes you can't always see it right on the water, but um, when you're moving around, if you see these changes like this, you know this uh, this eastern side over here might be the place to be. You probably once you pass that canal and you see that water change, these fish might be packed right here in this corner. That might be something to look for. And you can also have the opposite. You can have a dirty, dirty canal. You can have a golden little spot where it stacks up clean water's coming through. And man, that just might be a gobble fish right there. So uh, just from the surface, you wouldn't see this. But if you're passing by it, take a look. And sometimes that water is dirty on top and it'll be clean underneath. So there's probably a whole zone of clean water underneath that kind of comes way out. So uh, these are the type of things to look for. Questions about some of the subjects we went over? I think we get the lights now. So when the the tide's rising, you want to fish the marshes, and when it's going down, you want to get out of them. There's not any hard rules or anything, but I mean, what would you say? Like, it depends on what species, really. Right. So let's say you're uh, in the spring, coming up on spring, you want to go trout fishing. If you have, if you watch a tide chart and you have a good weather day and you know you're gonna have a high tide at noon and you fish that morning, the last hour of that high tide, uh, I would definitely be farther back in there than I normally would versus let's say I had a high tide at, at nine o'clock and now I'm already past that, I'm gonna go fish another area. Well, I'll fish one area, now I'm gonna do something else. I'm gonna go in another area. Man, it's starting to get dirty back there. Maybe I would pull out a little more. So sometimes uh, the tide dictates the movement. They're going to go in, and they might come out. Especially you big trout. They're going to come in and feed, and then they'll drop back off. Sometimes your big trout will hang around redfish in ponds, and we do hear that quite often, where middle of summer, they're on top water, and man, this five pound trout blew up in the middle of a pond, and it was June, you know. So there's exceptions. But uh, yeah, high tide, I like to, you know, fish deeper. And then on the falling tide, catch them at the intersections as everything's coming out. <coughs> Any other questions? Steve, yeah, on water clarity, you didn't talk about when the fresh water mixes with the uh, salt water and what oh, happens. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Density. So, uh, I used to fish uh, Point La Hatch a lot, and um, but, uh, now it's so fresh. I fish Venice a lot too. And uh, one thing I noticed over there, we would have you would have that fresh water rolling across the top, and that saltier, denser water would be down. It's heavier. It's down below it. And I'm telling you, you could cast closer to the bank and catch bass 
and drop off. It, would, it was just like a line. As you dropped off, boom, let it sink, 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 trout. So uh, a lot of times, the multi, that's how we get, have this whole swirling effect of multi-species. Man, I caught three fish in one canal, bass, redfish, and trout. Uh, sometimes they're gonna, uh, they're gonna stage based on that salinity and wherever that line is. That fresh water is usually only less than a foot of the top of that, uh, on that salty water. Steve, you got a, uh, you got a comprehensive uh, weather page up there with lots of information. Do uh, you share that spot, that page? Yeah, uh, so what that is, is that is a uh, free weather underground. Um, when you go to weather underground, you can <laughs> type in the locations and it has dots all over the state. It doesn't have all of them, but it has a lot of weather stations. Okay. Find your weather station and go down to the 10 day forecast. And in that 10 day forecast, you'll be able to see all those things coming together. Very much pressure, the wind. So that's the one of the sites I go to. Fish weather is also another one. So fish weather um, has an advantage over weather underground in that you can uh, go right to the zone or the area. You don't have to rely on a weather station, but you can key in with a, uh, a pin to exactly where you're going to fish. Uh, sir. Yeah. Uh, tidal movement. You, uh, reading, you know, some various articles or whatever. The people that I've read said, you know, 0.7 or greater to okay. optimize, or yeah. So, uh, especially uh, back when like concentrating was super hot, <laughs> there was a rule of thumb that you wanted a perfect one. And when you had a perfect one foot tide, you got the best of both worlds. And you could get a good bite throughout the whole day and all that. Uh, when you had about a 0.5, it was kind of fickle. It wasn't enough tide to wash that bait through the bridges and off the bottoms. Whereas you get up to about a 0.8 to a 1, it's enough tide to force the bait to swirl and get up off the bottom. And get out of their hiding spots. Over that, you get into about uh, one eight to two, and you can hardly keep your lure down. It was deep water. That's where a lot of that came from. But in our marshes, um, we can get away with, uh, with lower tides by <coughs> focusing on concentration points where we have more tidal movement because it's a funnel. So we can make up for that in the marshes. When we have too much tide, we have too much tide, and um, we can get away with it by fishing bigger bays, bigger areas of water. So the marsh, we have something we can do about it, but Lake Pontchartrain was, was tough on that. That's what a lot of that came from. Ship Channel, too, at Calcasieu. Mm -hmm. You can fish a ship channel, and when it's rolling through there, no good. Uh, I guess now we'll talk about depth finders for a little bit. Um, I don't have too much to talk about with depth finders because everybody has different depth finders and uh, you know everybody's programming them a little bit different. Uh, I have a Lowrance TI-5. Oops, that's empty. I use lithium batteries. These are two of the batteries I use. This is a 10 amp Dakota lithium. This is like five years old. I have a flex seal on it. I've kind of stripped my wires and tied it up without just using the clips because the clips kind of corrode over a while. But flex seal can seal pretty much anything. Uh, I like to use it, you know, if you got a chance to let it dry. It makes a good connection. This is just like the regular Hobie connections. I don't know. They probably sell these at uh, Radio Shack. If Radio Shack's still in business or I don't think on the <laughs> Amazon. How old are you, dude? All to Amazon. How old are you, man? It's informal. Come on. All right. Uh, no cool batteries. This is the new one uh, I use. I just keep them both around. Um, this is the same 10 amp battery. It's really small. It lasts all day long. Uh, the good thing about these uh, lithium batteries is the life cycle of the actual battery itself lasts for years versus the lead acid battery. It's got a half life. Uh, you know, after about a year, it's probably only producing about as half as much. Uh, holding charge as it used to, so you're going to have to replace that very often. These cost about 100 
140 bucks, depending on what you get. Uh, a lead acid battery might only cost you 35 bucks, but you're gonna end up buying them five times within the life cycle of this. On the shelf, we have a blue light special there over here. <laughs> <laughs> he does stock these. Yeah, these are great. I mean, the, the waterproof connections and everything, it's, it's real simple to install. The charger, uh, can't say enough about these batteries. They're really thought out, well made for fishermen. This is kind of like the uh, do-it-yourself kind of special, but if you have the extra 20, 40 bucks, just get this thing because it's awesome. Uh, depth finder uses. Mainly I use my depth finder in a, if I'm fishing in the winter. Temperature-wise, that kind of tells my brain initially what to do. When I'm going into the winter and I see that temperature reading, first thing, I'm hopping in the water, I check the temperature. All right, it's 65. Okay, I can do anything with 65 degree weather. I can throw, catch fish on the bottom, I can catch fish on top. Uh, you know, there's, there's no, that's like kind of like the perfect temperature. You know, 60 to 75 would be like the optimum. You can do whatever presentation you want. Um, if I get in my kayak and I see 48 degrees, I'm like, whoa, okay, I gotta change some things. 48 degrees. Pretty much everything shuts down except redfish. You can go catch some redfish in a deep hole. <clears throat> and another, another thing to consider is your depth finder is reading the temperature on the bottom of your kayak. So the top of the water is closer to the cold air. So the top of the water is the coldest probably in the winter. Down low, if you're fishing in 20 feet of water, there might be a thermocline. That, that water down there might be different. It might be, you know, five degrees warmer at the bottom of 20 degrees, especially if the cold front just came in that night and you're in a dead end canal. That's why so many people go and fish those deep water areas. Um, a depth finder really helps you kind of know when to change your presentation. Uh, a lot of times in these winter tournaments, like minimalist challenge, start the day, depth finder, 48 degrees, catching reds. I'm gonna start with my reds because I wanna give the time as much, the sunlight as much time as it can to warm up those flats uh, until I see some change in that temperature and I, I see that the, the uh, changing temperature on the depth finder reading is gonna correspond to the feeding pattern of those fish that are also waiting for it to get a little warmer. Um, 48, I think the, what was last year's temperature in the morning? It was like really cold. Oh, yeah. It was like 46 maybe? Yeah. yeah. So it was like 46 two years ago, and there was, there was literally 12 trout at the tournament caught the whole time. I caught 10 of them. <laughs> because I waited until the very last minute in a spot where I saw the water go up to 48.5. And I was like, all right, I got reds. This is the warmest place I found. I'm gonna sit there and work this little area as slow as I can on the bottom, really gingerly, just to make it as easy as possible. So maybe if a trout is sitting there, kind of coming out, going out of his coma, he'll just kind of, oh, there's an easy bait and just kind of eat it. You know, so that was my whole strategy, deep, dead-end canals, the warmest temperature, waiting until the last second in the afternoon. If you didn't realize, there is a temperature in which trout shut down. And there are, it is somewhere in the 40s. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with where the water temperature <coughs> was and how fast it's falling. They're going to shut down in the 40s somewhere. Now, when do we have those rare events when we have uh, fish kills? That is, why do we have those? We get down into the low 40s or the upper 30s in some of the shallower areas where they can't get down any deeper. They're as deep as they can go in the water, thermocline, and just <coughs> cold water sinks. And they're moving their gills. You ever catch a cold trout and it's moving like this? In the summer, it's like this. And in the winter, it's like this. Well, their gills. They lose the ability to even flap their gills and they suffocate. Because their gills are moving, 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 and they, they get so cold that they can't move them and they literally suffocate. And that's where your fish gills come from. They don't freeze. So people uh, mistakenly think, oh, they froze. You know, No, they just, their metabolism slows down that much. Another use for depth finder is obviously locating fish. Where you want to use that to locate fish it's really dependent on your depth of water. I wouldn't use a depth finder to go into a redfish pond to locate fish because obviously you have to be above the fish to, to find it. So 
it's not going to do you any good if you're a red fisherman that likes to go in marsh ponds a lot. It's, it'll help you with temperature. Might tell you when to get out of that marsh pond in the middle of the summer. Okay, the water is 92. Probably should get out of here because uh, that's even hot for when I want to go in the sauna. So the redfish is certainly going to be off into some bayou nearby. Um, setting your depth finder is uh, is something that you will adjust with your um, <coughs> well, uh, uh, sensitivity. Yeah. All right. That's the number one thing to do when you depth find it. Every time you get in the water, depending on where you're at, I like to adjust the sensitivity. Sometimes if I'm looking at the bottom, you know, you get this kind of great gradient of like color bars and stuff. I want to play with that sensitivity until I can see some bait and then I start to like decrease that bait a little bit. Because I don't want that bait to be flooding my screen if I'm in the past. I want the big fish to show up, catch my attention, but I don't want it like full of bait and all that kind of stuff. You can set your sensitivity so high that it's just like any Every kind of rope, uh, boat wash, see. prop wash comes through and it's like, it's all red. Oh. it just blows up. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so just sensitivity first and foremost, um, mapping the bottom, they have all kinds of great things for depth finders these days, all the Hobies come with the uh, adjustable depth finder uh, attachment on the bottom for the side scan units. Uh, if you have, uh, they're, they're pretty affordable now. The TI that I have has a side scan unit and that is great to just go into like a bayou and like look at the sides. You can find stumps down there. You can go into the pass and I can be between pilings and I can see scour holes next to the pilings and I can pitch off to the side, the right, the left. It's not gonna show you fish like a sonar will show you fish. So you need to change between your down scan and your sonar. Sonar is going to read those fish, those, those arcs. That's what you want to do if you're in the pass and you're waiting for that big red blob of uh, bull reds to come underneath and you're like, oh, I got to drop down. As soon as you see that on sonar, that's when you're going to drop down. You can set the sensitivity on your sonar to pick up a jig if you can really dial in your unit. I've been out with uh, friends snapper fishing. They got their units really dialed in because they want to see all that live bottom on the bottom of a, a, a gulf, like out, if, say if they went out to Pensacola Beach or something, and they went to some of these reefs. A lot of these places they'll find, just because their depth finder is so dialed in, they're gonna, they're gonna paddle out and they're gonna see something just on the bottom because you, you have a whole lot of nothing. You know, sand is not gonna change the terrain too much. But when you're paddling out, you know, over a couple of miles, the course of a couple of miles, and you see just a little bit of something, that makes you slow down. You can see maybe that there's different contours in the bottom texture, if you will. That's gonna indicate that there's something hard down there, something different from the surrounding areas you wanna fish that. Uh, this is for, I'm talking about for offshore, kind of fishing for snapper. <coughs> uh, another interesting thing that that is uh, happening right now is for the Lawrence units is the uh, Genesis Live mapping capabilities. So all you have to do is take an SD, micro SD card, put it in your, your Lowrance unit. It has to be 32 gigs or less. You go to your, uh, your mapping program, you just click Genesis Live. It'll show your map that has the standard kind of map that it comes with really nondescript. It's just a giant big blue hole basically with some contours. But as you paddle back and forth, it'll map that to the nearest half of a foot. And so you can make this beautiful contour map of the past. What's a great thing you could use for a great map of the past that's the biggest kayak fishing tournament in the world? Right, the bulls. So that is a huge benefit if you're doing something like that. You can go find every little hump, valley, like anything that would change and be a benefit to you to know exactly where to drop. It's a different contour in the broad, vast desert of flatness down there. That is highly valuable. I would definitely use that if you have a depth finder. Uh, the more time you fish it, the better it gets. It, upstate, it updates itself and uh, you can actually copy it and give it to your buddy. Like let's say if you have it, you can bring it on your computer, copy the file, give it to him, he can put it in his depth finder and then you're, you're both set. Uh, also you have um, got features on your fish finders and things today talking about all electronics where you have Bluetooth capability, and you can connect to your power poles. Uh, so there's a lot of features out there that are really useful. Uh, I know our friend Brandon Barton made a, a pretty funny video on uh, 
at one of our tournaments where he was he had connected to Matt's uh, power pole and he was controlling it because he was about 30 feet away. So was, What's going on over there? <laughs> Just going up and down. <coughs> but yeah, it's it's uh, really convenient though if you're going to use those uh, features. Do you leave your sonar active when you're fishing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I I tend to not use like the super high ping on it just because. It just sounds like crazy distracting to me, and I, would, I can't imagine what it sounds like to fish. I try to be as minimal as I can in my approach to the fish. My main thing if I'm fishing in the past is I want that contour map, and I want some ping showing me when that big school comes through, but I don't need it like I mean, that's just, I can't imagine those fish underneath there, they got like those little vertical lines and the lateral lines, that must drive me crazy. What's the minimum amount of water that you can take advantage of what you're talking about? Uh, 10 feet, 8 feet, you know. Um, some of my places that I fish trout in the winter, uh, I can get on top of them in that low of, of uh, shallow of water. And I can see like when they're suspended off the bottom. I can see like the bait school is suspended off the bottom. Sometimes you can see the size of the bait. You can see, okay, it's a bunch of little stuff. Sometimes it's big stuff. Um, and that just kind of... It, and, and you can see the bait cloud sometimes, and then you can see like the predatory fish underneath it, and the bait shape changing, so you know that they're feeding. I mean, there's a lot of neat little things that you can see, especially in wintertime fishing, when they're all stacked up in one spot. Any other questions about depth finders? Uh, sort of related, you, you went over the temperatures, that was a question I had, trying to get an idea of that this whole fishing by the season. Um, but to me, we're supposed to be in winter, and this is more like a fall temperature. And so, it's, yeah, that's what we were kind of alluding to about the early uh, spring, the really. Usual, yeah. <coughs> so we're really the weather temperature is outside, and the water temperature is almost like a, a mid to early spring right now. So I would, if so you, in the yeah, if you keep a journal or or kind of remember a memory mm -hmm. of like your past trips, you would think about attacking your fishing trip like you would later on in the year. Like what you did in April that was successful last year might be successful now. And probably will be. Anything else? Uh, always keep a towel in your pocket because all these touch screens are driving nuts because who in the world invented a touch screen depth finder for a person whose hands are always wet? I don't know, but <laughs> keep a towel. You can, you can do the little screens, uh, those are very helpful too. Put your little screens over the fish finders, uh, they shade it. Uh, there's a couple advantages to doing that too. Also, when you take your <coughs> unit off, you know, you drop it or you throw it in something or whatever, a bag or something, you know, that screen protector is on there, so if you drop it, it hits that plastic. It's going to protect your uh, screen from breaking. A lot of guys break their screen, <coughs> pull it off and drop it. Especially on the little ram mounts or ball mounts, they're undoing it and it falls off on the ground. Well, that screen protector has saved a bunch of them. That's good. The awesome. touch screen uh, complaint also goes to waterproof cameras. If you're getting a camera for the IFA or something like that, do not get a touch screen camera. You just handle the big old bull red, it's in your lap, it's slapping you in, you got goo all over, and you're like, no, that ain't gonna work. You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to wipe your hands about 50 times, get them blow them dry and then hope and pray that it works I just I'm not a touch screen fan so really as far as fish finders in the marsh temperature temperature really but and, it can help you find holes though. find holes yeah. yeah so depth always is a nice thing you can go out of a little marsh pond into a little cut and all of a sudden you see it's 12 feet right there and you didn't know it was 12 feet so, you so put on that cold day Remember, hey, we're gonna put the whole thing together and back in that cold day, I'm going back to that hole I found, which you may have just blasted right past if you didn't have a union. Yeah. You know? Fallen tide, a couple probably like fallen tide like five or something way back in the day. I was fishing in the marsh and all of a sudden I found an eight foot hole right in the middle. And that hole was lo and behold the place that I caught my flounder. So it and death finder paid for itself. <laughs> those flounder are hard to come by. Yes, he got a check. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions about depth finding? Yes, sir. What do you uh, think the best way to mount the transducer is on closed arms or 
down at the bottom of the kayak. I just I always like to just put it on the inside. If you don't if you don't have a, a kayak that has a system for mounting it, I just like the old uh, the old uh, gardening uh, knee pad and cut a, cut it in a hole shape and and glue that thing down and just kind of shove it in there. And I mean the temperature might be off a couple of degrees <coughs> because it's it's through hole, but sensitivity wise it, it's pretty good. And I've used that probably for five years of my fishing life without any real you know so it's actually transmitted through the hole and through the hole right right you right, have right. to get some kind of uh so they'll use those pads you can board yeah. those pads that mount around the and what the purpose of that is is to hold so you need some kind of a, a medium to go between the transducer and the plastic because you have it's uneven it's not a perfect mm -hmm. fit there's air it's not going to work very well but if you fill that in, like when they do ultrasounds for ladies, yeah. they use the, uh, the, you know, whatever that gel is. Well, and it, it creates a solid connection, really, is what it does. But you do the same thing there, and they say you can heat up, and I've done this myself. There's a type of a silicone. It's a, you heat it up with hot water. So you put it in a pot of boiling water. And then when you squeeze it out, it comes out a lot more liquid. It's not as goopy. And then you let the air bubbles will come right out of it. No air bubbles. And then when you place that transducer in there and you squish it down, you have no air and you have a nice tight uh, fit. And then you get a much better read. Is it fully functional where all the functions work? Oh, yeah. yeah. Now your temperature, you just are getting a temperature against the bottom of the hull. So when you first put your kayak in, really give it 30 minutes for that temperature to push up through that thermal couple that's located inside that transducer head. So uh, it's, it's going to take a while for it to sense any kind of real temperature. Especially if you're going fishing in the evening time and your kayak's riding on the back of your truck and the sun's beating down on it and it's like 300 degrees inside your kayak and then you launch it like, what? Yeah. <laughs> 90 degree water! <laughs> so you talk about the high temperature water, 90 degree water. At what point do you want to move out of the marsh and go ahead and maybe just I mean, I've seen redfish just shut down. You know, yeah. there they are. You throw a bait right in front of them, and they just won't eat. And uh, pretty much any time after June, I don't like to fish in the marsh after nine, unless it's like overcast and rainy. Like when you get a nice little uh, midday shower, that can like really ignite things again. Uh, it's a good thing in in Louisiana at, towards like August or so. We get those like like clockwork showers, 3 p.m. in August. A lot of times I'll fish in the morning, I'll go take a nap, if I'm like planning like a three day like trip, and then right after that 3 p.m. like little shower, I'll go back again. All right, we got a whole lot of talk, uh, tackle to talk about because I brought uh, about a tenth of my tackle now that my son's stolen half of it. So, uh, <laughs> Just want to go over a couple of knots, uh, just doing the Boy Scout thing up here. Um, a loop knot, a loop knot, this is what I tie like probably 75% of my baits to my tackle with. You just start with a hole, or uh, just a regular pretzel knot, go through your lure, back through here, give it a little distance, wrap this about three or four times, and then back through that initial and it creates hopefully a nice clean loop knot so that your top water shakes when it's on it it's really strong it won't cinch down and like in and hold that and hold that bait stiff it gives you a lot of action so this is the loop knot that I really like to do you can tie it really quick all the time and it'll show you one thing about that knot that if you guys notice before you untie it they'll just hold it up the tag end is facing down if you tie it correct. If you practice, that tag end faces back. It's not going to catch the grass. If you have it, if you tie a knot where your tag end is facing upwards on the line, you can catch grass, especially if you're red fishing or, or anything where you want a nice clean presentation. Uh, pulling a spoon through some grass or whatever, you know, to fly right over that knot and won't fall up on you. That's All a right. key feature. Can you use that for like floral? Yeah, yeah, it works great for it. And this, the other knot that I'll do, and this is pretty much just for plastics on a jig head, is the old, you know, um, 
Going around, going around, going around. Same time. Yeah. yeah. And then just hold it super tight against. Uh, I usually go through another time, but for time's sake, we're joining lines. Let's pretend that this is your fluorocarbon and this is your braid. braid. I use braid pretty much on all my reels. If you like fluoro, then uh, you're not going to look a lot, or if you like mono, it's going to look a lot nicer when you do a uni to uni, which is the quick and dirty kind of way to join two lines. The problem, which I'll show you, is when you do a uni to uni, which is, you know, you just make, make a loop and then you run the line around it, inside it. And then these two slide together. And then you got a joint here. Look how thick that area where it joins is. It's just ginormous. So a lot of people, if they have time, they'll do an FG knot before they get on the water. Like if they're setting up their their uh, tackle the night before, which we'll probably do that. And, and it matters a lot more when you have a thicker piece of fluorocarbon. If you're using just, you know, something that's really equally weighted, uh, you know, like a 15 pound fluoro on like a 30 pound uh, piece of braid, it's not gonna give you that giant differential, but, and Steve showed me this fast way to do this. So you take your, your uh, braid and you take a piece of fluorocarbon and you just uh, loop, 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 and then you just alternate up and down. And as you do it, you're cinching it and pulling it tight. And you're basically making a Chinese finger trap around this big giant piece until you have something really tight and you can cinch this down you wet it when it's when you're using real fluoro and it makes a nice tight kind of weave all the way around it's, it's awesome looking and then after you're done with doing the weave part then you're going to want to just clean this and whip finish this up and there's a way to do it and after you try it, that it makes the tag in go in the same direction of your attachment. So I usually like to finish it twice, but you can see once I've clipped these ends, that that's gonna fit through my guides so much better than when I was using that uni to uni. So you wanna do this when you're using something like 40 pound fluorocarbon, 50 pound fluorocarbon, you were fishing bulls, uh, this is definitely the knot that I would recommend. Take some practice. It's not like tying a bimini twist or anything, but it is. It takes a little bit of practice, and you really want to kind of cinch it and tuck it in when you're when you're working on it. So you snook fishermen in Florida. Uh, you know that's what a lot of them, that's their primary deal. They're going to use that heavier fluoro to braid connection. I mean, with a big snook. I mean, they they usually use forty pounds of fluoro. So uh, and Learning the FG was uh, really big for those guys, and it really can work for us too. Yeah, we, we don't have, luckily we don't have fish that can pull us through mangrove roots and stuff where we have to pull them back out like a bass. Uh, you know, fishing for bass with, with a leader would certainly be the way to do that. Uh, most people just tie straight to braid, but uh, if you really wanted to use fluorocarbon. Uh, when I go fishing, I usually keep like a, a little kind of thing full of different size uh, fluorocarbon leader material that's just kind of clipped to my kayak that I can reach up, spool off some, clip it, and then retie if I need to. Uh, this is just a good way to, I just saw somebody do this one time and I thought, hey, this is a good way to keep all your stuff together. Uh, going through tackle, I've got all kinds of stuff to go through here. Uh, let's start with top water stuff. I love top water. So, whenever I go fishing, I carry two boxes of topwaters just because I'm throwing them probably 
60, 70 percent of the time. Just he because likes so. I, I just love to catch fish in top water. Because I mean, you fish for fun, and what's funner than seeing a big fish eat a top water? Nothing. So, um, you know, I got big ones, I got loud ones, I got ones for redfish. This is this one is looks like a super spook, but it's got kind of heavier duty hooks. This is like my bull red version. Then. Uh, and then you got just like the trout variety, you know, super spooks. Uh, the rule of thumb that I go with, if it's dark and cloudy outside, I just want a dark top water. If it's bright and sunny, you know, lighter colored bone. Uh, early in the morning, maybe something with some flash in it, like uh, a uh, like a chrome one that we used to be chrome, or uh, uh, quieter, quieter, bigger baits. Whenever it's really calm, like the uh, full size. Uh, Junior. Yeah, this is the Top Dog original, full size. So it's really quiet, doesn't have a lot of noise. This is, I don't want to beat them over the head with noise when it's really kind of calm in the marsh or on the flats where I'm fishing. And then conversely, if it's rough outside, the real kind of high frequency, I want to use that whenever it gets rougher outside and I need to compete with Mother Nature for their attention. Their tone, their tone's a big thing too. Deep tone, high pitch. And then whenever they're feeding on shrimp, I like to do kind of little weird things. And this is a little bait that is a seville that, that really just pops like doop, doop, like a shrimp. And uh, it, it, it hardly makes any noise. It sits really low and awkward in the water. It's a ghost walker. It's kind of halfway filled with water, but it just is really natural. And it's just, whenever a redfish are feeding on shrimp in the marsh, this is what I go with. And it casts really far because it's filled with water. Um, other top waters. Okay, sometimes you're fishing with top waters and the fish are not connected. They're popping it out of the water and kind of getting frustrated a little bit. Um, and I don't have. Oh, here. This Paul Brown. This is my favorite time to use this. It's a, a, it's kind of like a soft style walking bait on top of the, uh, what's it called? Soft, soft dog. Soft dog. So it throws really far, it's heavy, but it sits kind of low in the water and it's not really easy to work. But whenever a fish hits it, it doesn't miss it or toss it in the air. It's basically engulfed. Whenever you get in the fish and they're blowing it up, and they're not they're just kind of almost playing with it more than they're eating it try this i've had a lot of success changing it up to this yeah john and uh if you're interested in that just letting you know we have them on sale in the back <laughs> you can buy them really cheap right now awesome <laughs> they're in the back corner we have the, a lot of these things are, are for sale and, <laughs> but you know that so how i organize my tackles i just have like big boxes of top waters and I don't bring this in the kayak I just kind of like pick my favorite ones like okay I know it's gonna be cloudy so I might put a bigger dark assortment in my little box and I'll put that and then I'll put this just back at home or in my truck if I'm gonna be fishing for three or four days um, likewise with jerk bait box uh, this is kind of like the go-to kind of bait this time of year when they suspend we talked about when fish suspend this is uh, a really good time when the water's still cool right now. More of a finesse, really a lot of action, really need a, a light presentation rod to throw these things. They're mostly pretty light. Uh, they kind of shake and wiggle all around the top of the water column. You're talking about from, the, from half a foot under to about two feet deep, most of them. Some of them go a little bit deeper. But uh, really a great bait if you find uh, basically like a flooded marsh pond with some suspended grass off the bottom and you can work that water column this time of year right above that grass. Put the big trout that are waiting to ambush out of that grass. Uh, these are really killer right now. And another key too is um, the food, it really, really matches what they're after right now. They're, they may not be crashing top water quite yet. And, uh, you're gonna have like your silver side minnows or 
uh, some of your other types of uh, cockahoe minnows and mud minnows and things like that that they're after right now. This imitates that very well. Whereas later in the summer, we're going to get the pogies, we're going to get the shrimp, we're going to get the fair mud all the top. But right now, they're eating what they can get, which is a lot of stuff that this imitates. Um, a lot of you guys around here fish the Big Lake area. Y'all probably all know about wade fishing and uh, kayak fishing in Big Lake. This is a great little tackle box that is a wade style tackle box. It's got holes in it. This is what I use if I'm going. Sometimes, uh, you know, even though I'm in a kayak, I like to slow myself down and the best way to do that is to get out of the water. And I'll just literally take this with a couple of baits and I'll park my kayak on the, on the side. And I'll, this, is, this is not tournament fishing, this is fun fishing. And when I'm over there and I just want to grind it out in a spot for, uh, you know, a couple of hours. What's great about being in a kayak is you park your kayak over there and if there's this little really great spot, you kind of almost hog your area. So you put your kayak here and then you start walking over here and it kind of blocks people from like going in this little zone. So, <laughs> so those of you that are fighting the crowds at Big Lake might want to bring a kayak because it's a nice little tactic to uh, occupy some zone, if you will. Why does it have holes in it? Just so it drains, so it's not way fishing. So yeah, so it goes in the water and comes out and it drains, so it doesn't uh, like if you if you get a totally waterproof tackle box, it'll like keep the moisture in there and it'll all rust out. This way, I can just take it, hose it, close it, and it'll dry out. Uh, and you put so, just what you think you're going to use. Yeah. I mean, you don't put like the whole uh, you know bring your, you know your your best of everything in there. 25, 30 days, you just bring four or five. You're way fishing. Um, I like corgis, so you know I bring an assortment of corgis with me. Uh, you know the Miradine size ones are just kind of an all-around good bait to throw with any size of lure. Uh, if you're going for bigger fish, you know you might go with something like a Devil or Super Devil. Or uh, these baits really work well when you know that there are trout in the area. I wouldn't use these baits as a search bait. If you're out there fishing a new body of water that you're like, oh, I need to see if there's some trout out here, you really have to work these baits kind of slow in the winter to really maximize their effort. I mean, I like when I'm throwing a top water or a corgi, um, you know, I'll throw it out and I'll just count like one, two, three, four, five, six, Take a nap. Eight, and then I might go. And then I just, one, two, three, four. And as I'm going down, I'm reeling down. But I'm not reeling to the point where I'm engaging that lure. So then I pop it, pop it, and then I'm reeling down slow. And I, but I'm not reeling down to the point where I'm engaging. And all of a sudden, you'll get, you'll get a bite, and it'll just be sucked down as it's falling and drifting down. And you just do that, and it's methodical, and it's boring, but it makes the easiest way for a big trout to feed when he doesn't want to exert a lot of energy. Second point is when they hit the bait, it doesn't shock them because it's like hard plastic. And I don't know if you've ever seen a fish turn on a bait and hit it and just kind of pull away so fast that you would never be able to set the hook on them. I, th I believe the main par part about those uh, soft baits is it gives them a hair of a second longer to hold it for you to set the hook in it or to to really grab it and eat it. So uh, usually you don't get a lot of missed bites on a corky. They're usually, they're committed. So that's the good thing about them. If you're going fishing on a day where you might get lucky to only have three bites, what do you want them to bite on? Something that they're gonna hold in their mouth or something that you might just barely feel that tick that they're gone on. That also applies to, let's put that towards a tournament day. Let's say you have a nice trout or a, you know an acceptable trout and you or you have a nice couple of trout and uh, say well they're all 15 16 you know that's the time when I'm gonna just pull out a bigger bait and go for one one bite no I want that big one you know you might get that plus 20 trout but you're gonna have you may work for it and this is the time when you might want to pull out that bait and go for it uh, moving on to other suspending baits. Uh, 
Stick Sheds and Mirrodines are some of my favorites. And I always keep a bunch of them in one capital compartment so they always, you know, get hooked up. So this is the regular original size Mirrodine. It comes in four sizes now. It comes in smaller than this. It comes in a little bit bigger than this, and it comes in like way too big now. So if you're, uh, I mean, it's, uh, you know, you can match the hatch basically with this bait. It's, it's meant to be any kind of pogey situation bait, any kind of, uh, you know, uh, glass minnow kind of situation. It falls really slowly. It has a lot of flash. Uh, they make the original one in a heavy variety. So I like to use this heavy variety when I want to cover a lot of water because I don't have to wait as long for it to get into the strike zone. I can really cover it a lot of water. This one throws a lot better on a bait caster. I have a special bait caster that is a medium light rod that really loads the light baits well that I can that can be accurate with something as light as this. Um, you know, most people with their throwing on bait casters might be uh, you know a quarter ounce plastic or a, a top water, something substantial where they can just like pinpoint where they want to be but sometimes you like the ability of a bait caster but you want to finesse bait and so I have a couple of different uh, setups that I use depending on what I'm throwing when I'm throwing this and I want to be real accurate maybe I'm throwing around pilings or I'm, I'm throwing around corner banks I'm just so much better with a bait caster than I am with a spinning reel that I, I tend to build a setup especially for this okay. I do throw the small baits on a spinning reel, so it is personal preference. It is what suits your style. Um, I think uh, I think I, can I do throw, too. I just yeah. Depending on if I want to be in more, uh, if I want to pinpoint accuracy or if I want distance. If I want just pure distance and I'm going out in the open, I'm totally using my you know medium light spinning reel yeah. with super light line. I can just hump. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, it's not just a, it's a personal preference thing as well. Uh, this is a Sabeel stick shad. It comes in sinking, suspending, and floating. This is a really neat bait because it's really hyper realistic, but it floats. It doesn't float like a top water. It floats just like right at the top of the water. So, but when you pull it, it goes down and it shakes like a mirror But then when you let it rest, it comes back to the top. And so it's a really great bait if you're fishing over like some oysters, but it's shallow and they're not biting on top water. This is a great bait. You can throw it in there. You can work it just enough to where it gets down, but then it comes back up. And a lot of times you'll just let this thing rest on the top of the water and they'll come and smash it. You know, after they've seen it and they come and it's easy picking, they'll just come and hit it. I use this a lot of times uh, in the marsh or I'll use it like under lights at night. Uh, great little bait. Comes in a lot of a million different colors. What, what is it? That's a Beal stick shad. So there's advantages and disadvantages about different jerk baits. A lot of jerk baits out there with a bill on them, uh, like we've got two talked about earlier, uh, they are more difficult to work because they have a drag to them. So you have to pull them, pull them, and you see, you know, uh, Kevin Van Dam. He's up. He's got his signature jerk baits, and he's choo, 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 well, he's in a standing position. In a kayak, it is a little more difficult, but these have so much of a, an advantage. You have the noise have all the features and uh, you know it doesn't have that drag on it so you can work this eight hours you work this all day without getting tired you have very little pull against you but it makes a little noise has the flash has the pause has all the other features but that it doesn't have the vibration that the lift uh, jerk baits do so sometimes the vibration is more what they're keying in on other times this is just fine so it casts a lot better than a lift bait. Yes. Lift bait, I mean, if you have a windy day, I mean, you can almost forget about it unless you're casting with the wind. Uh, I mean, you, you need really like a light uh, light rod, something to load that and, and cast it far. Um, these flat shads are good. These are, you know, the uh, pogey imitation that, the, it's kind of like a, a Oh, rattle trap. Rattle trap, you know, but just the more hyper realistic. Uh, you know, you can use rattle trap, you can use kind of really anything. I just have a few of these. 
those are good for you know working down deep and then kind of zipping and you know covering a lot of depth in the water column all at once because you can go down the bottom you can cover it five feet up and it goes right back down five feet up and so you can really target fish that are suspended up here down at the bottom you can pull them off the ground uh, a lot of times i'll fish that you know in a in a place where i'm working different sections of a bayou like if like if i'm going down bayou lafouche and it's like five feet here but then it's like 10 feet here i might work it and i'll let it go down for like two two seconds here on the five foot and then right here i can let it go down really deep and then zip it up zip it up and then it'll pull a big trout off the bottom like in the summer when they're like down in the cooler water. They're great multi-species lure too. Uh, everything will hit them. Uh, I caught a python and then uh, when I looked in the evidence, I brought me a couple of those. <laughs> so they work for all kinds of species. This is probably like my go-to favorite, uh, just uh, twitch bait. It is the catch five. It is really heavy, so it casts really far, but it does not sink very fast and it's got a lot of flash. I use this thing all the time, got lots of big trial with it. Uh, it's not like one of the cool baits to use anymore, I guess, you know, but it's it's not flat like a like a, a Miradine, so it, it casts a lot better. It's, it's more, uh, like, you know, it's chunky. It's not, uh, but it casts so much better and it, and it sinks really slow and it, and it has a good movement. Give it a chance if you haven't used one in a while. I mean, I'm just comparing it to similar size Miradine. It just casts way better. And a lot of times when I'm fishing for big trout, the further cast is the one that's yielding the bigger trout. I don't know if they just can smell me or what, but they're as far as they can get away from me. And it's like that really long cast, boom. And then I'm twitch, twitch and it's like, they're shaking way over there. And I don't know, it's uh. It's a distance casting. We've talked about casting over the years, how important it is to become a good caster. You know, that's just one of the fundamentals to fishing. You can you can take your take your little setup and practice in the house, cast a little bucket, a little cup or something. Get in the backyard, cast around. It really does help. But long casts do matter, and uh, they can make a huge difference when, especially trout. I mean, the whole slap, anything. Uh, can, and can make them spook and uh, you get that good long cast out there twitch twitch what happens first or second twitch that's almost always when that big sucker hits not right by the way uh, soft plastics I carry a variety of soft plastics with me uh, most are minnow imitation some are you know shrimp imitation the good old DOA shrimp or the um, the uh, what's the new one voodoo, voodoo shrimp we got some of those uh, I usually use those under cork. Sometimes when they want shrimp and they don't want them under a cork, don't forget to try just freelining these things. I've, this time of year, actually in the early spring, I've caught a lot of fish on that real slow drop uh, with the salt plastic. Uh, for the most part, I'm using natural colored plastics. You know, I might tail dip this. Uh, you know, basically my go-to is like the chicken on the chain color. It's mostly natural with a little bit of flash. You can get it pretty much in every size and any style. That's that's pretty much what I'm throwing most of the time. If the water's super dirty, I'm gonna throw like maybe an all black with a yellow tail, like the whole uh, opening night. Nice. Opening, uh, no, not opening night. Uh, oh, uh, morning glory. Morning glory, yeah. So that's like super contrasty. Uh, if it's really clean, really clear, I'm fishing in Florida, you know, I want like super hyper realistic stuff. Uh, these are some of these baits that we, me and Steve got in Sweden, they're, uh, I guess, Europeans are all into making stuff fancy looking, so they're, uh, they're pretty good. And I went, I went to Florida, uh, uh, quick story, I, a couple of years ago, we had that Panama <coughs> IFA, and I was fishing this bay over by uh, Port St. Joe, and I thought, well, you know, uh, I've got my, I've got my natural looking colors and everything. I got my natural looking hard baits and all. Man, I threw out there and that sun came up. And I'm telling you, everything I threw, it looked like a, 
uh, chartreuse bomb out there in that clear water. I mean, the cleanest looking bait I had. I said, man, I've seen something crystal clear with like two flakes in it. Yeah. It is amazing how you throw a bait out there and it just looks stupid out of place in that clear water. Well, we can have that situation here occasionally, but just it's not as much, you know. Right? It's, uh, so natural looking baits uh, can be used in uh, that sort of slightly off-colored water and still be very effective. Do, do you have a rule of thumb as the one that switch from one day color to another to another? Yeah, well, what my, one of my rules is, first of all, through experience, the cleaner the water, the more natural the bait, the lower the light, the darker the bait. I want a little flash when you have sun up. Uh, but the other thing is, if you're getting bit, and you're not hooking up, or you can tell where that hook is in the fish that you did catch, but you're having some hits, change color. Change color. If you're getting hits, and they're not eating it good, and that's what the, you'll hear the bass guys say that, they'll hold up this fish, look where he ate, and you'll show the crankbait, you know, you know, look at that. That is, show, what they're showing is, that fish really wanted it, and that's what you want to find. So when you're fish are really getting on it good, then you got to get the color. And that's uh, one of the key things. How Why I would change. How drastic is the color change? I mean, you can go with your palettes, you go with your natural, your bright, your, your light or whites, like ultraviolet's a good light kind of family color in the matrix. And you can go with your darks. So if, if you stick with those palettes and, um, and change around, you keep it simple. And you also want to think about mashing the hatch. If it's yeah. you know all shrimp and stuff that they're feeding on, you might want to pick something that's super yeah. shrimpy looking. You know, because we're fishing the canals in December this year, and like if you had like a gold clear flake, you were getting bit. If you're throwing anything else, you were not getting bit. It was a very match the hatch kind of thing with all the shrimp kind of just inundating these dead end canals, and we just uh, the color made all the difference in that situation. Uh, it's all. It's always nice to keep like things like rivets if you're in grassy areas. Uh, you know, some people like to use Texas rig worms or Texas rig their baits. Uh, this is a really good presentation to just throw uh, if you're in a place like uh, basins or something like that where you can throw over like a bunch of really thick grass and just cause some commotion. You can't throw your top water in there because it's got too much grass up top, but you can really pull some reds out of some heavy cover. For this kind of presentation, I like to throw a heavy spinning reel with heavy braid because I know I'm immediately going into grass. Uh, there's a bigger rivet that throws a little bit better than this. This one's a more finesse style. And uh, what a lot of times, this is another technique that we've talked about over the years. And I've gotten feedback over this before. Uh, so um, I think it's helped some guys out. And that is, if you get into an area, you don't see much happening. I don't see any obvious tailing redfish. I don't see any obvious emotion of sub feeding or whatever. You take a bait like this, and you bam, 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 and you make these quick blasting casts over a pond. And I cannot tell you how many times I saw him move. I, mean, I get over here, boom, 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 and as I'm reeling it, buzzing it, buzzing it, I see him move. I'm like, there he is. I just woke him up. And uh, for the minimalist, uh, um, we just had uh, a month ago. Uh, I pull into this little canal, and I saw absolutely nothing. The water was eight inches deep. I said, I don't see anything in here. I make a cast, and I went to make the cast, and as I was doing, I shuffled around in the kayak up off the side of it, and I saw this tail poke up out of the water, quarter inch. And he went back down. Went, oh, there he is. I reached around and grabbed my rod. I said, I don't see him again. I bumped it again. The tail flared up again. And now I saw exactly which end to throw. You know, over here on this side, which way to be facing. I could see it. So buzzing the top really does work to help show you a fish or get a fish excited that's going to eat something else. Uh, there's a variety of jig heads that we use depending on where we're throwing. Uh, you, know, you can use kind of like the weedless jig head if you want to, you know, keep it out of the grass. It's a little bit worse of a hook rate, hookup ratio, but uh, sometimes it's kind of like the 
the best option depending on if you're in a real grassy area for redfish. I mean, 90% of the time we're just using the old, uh, you know, standard jig head pokes out the top. Um, there's a variety of styles. Uh, the ones that we got at Minimalist Challenge were pretty good. They had, what were they called? Oh, those were the, uh, um, Death, Death, Death Grips. Yeah. So these have a bunch of like ribs, uh, you know, if you think about like an arrow piercing flesh and you can't pull it back out, it's just got a bunch of those ribs on it. This is particularly good with something that doesn't like to stay on your jig head, like a gulp that doesn't have like a real kind of hard, you know, uh, plastic. Uh, these are great jig heads. I really like them. Um, other jig heads that I use, this this is uh, a nice little jig head that I use with my kids. It's uh, got like a little spring and then it's kind of weedless and I can tie this on them and they pretty much never get hung up. I just let them go to town. It holds the bait on so that whenever they're slapping against the kayak or hung up in the weeds and they pull it out, then it doesn't totally mess it up and it's weedless and they Basically, whenever they're catching the fish, they're just kind of like, uh, and then all of a sudden they're hooked up. Uh, great for little kids. So they have an owner, right? Yeah. That's an owner. Yep. So if y'all want to see any of these things after the fact, just come up here. And the, the red trouble. Yeah. On the front. Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of, a lot of these lures, you're going to have, um, uh, you can have stock hooks. And uh, we like to upgrade the hooks if uh, we're going to go ahead and change, let them factory hooks get rusty, okay, I'm gonna change them out. So I'm buying some extra hooks and uh, I'm gonna put them on. It is a good idea to put a red hook on the front of so, some of your baits. So you can see this one, it has a red hook in the front, regular hook in the back. This is just kind of old superstition or whatever gives the fish a focus of where to go for. Maybe, uh, you know, you'll see a lot of people put little red dots on the bottom of the top water, a little spray paint. You're like, oh, what's, what's that? Why is there a little red? right in the middle of the bottom of that. I don't know what it is, it works. I've seen improvement on hookups. Uh, I just get a red, they sell these red uh, hooks for whatever reason, I put them usually on the front hook. Sometimes I put them on both, but mostly it's red in the middle, regular on the back. You guys ever heard of, uh, you know, maybe uh, an uncle or something, I had an uncle, that's what makes me think of that. He would always say, yeah, this crankbait, this one crankbait was working, and it had that orange dot on it. And if that orange dot came off or wore off or whatever, it wouldn't hit it. And it, it wouldn't hit no other crankbait but the one with the orange dot. Well, he, I mean, he would believe in that. And you've probably heard of that, too. And uh, it has a, has a lot to do with why they spray, uh, they'll spray color on the front of uh, lures is to try to get that focal point. That hook down there shining around, I think, is even better than the spray. Uh, using popping corks, that's pretty much a mainstay of Louisiana fishing. There's different kinds of popping corks. This is kind of one of the most popular, the Cajun Thunder. Just not too heavy, not too light, just good all around cork. Uh, I like to cut off the bottom swivel because it's already got a swivel on the top, and I just don't want like a bunch of jewelry hanging down in the water and just making it all busy. It's kind of like those guys you see with those those big black leaders with all the daisy chains off. It's like, you don't need all that stuff. You don't need all that. So I try to simplify these as much as I can. I, I, I usually take my uh, pliers and just clip those off. You know, one of them is good enough on the top. Uh, if I can't catch any fish and I'm like, just dying for a trout, this is kind of like the go-to thing. Like, you know, just throw it around and they'll, they'll find something. <laughs> if you're getting bumps on it, but you're, they're not eating it, sometimes I'll, I like downsize to something crazy small, you know, like a, uh, uh, what's the old school, sparkle beetle, or one of these, or like the really small uh, shrimp that they make now, the uh, tiny booties. Tiny booties, man, those little tiny booties, I can't tell you how many trout I've caught with those things in the middle of the summer, when they're just like, don't want to hit anything, you throw that little tiny voodoo underneath the popping cord, especially like if you're uh, with kids at Grand Isle and it's like 100 degrees and everything's kind of like, <laughs> you throw a little tiny voodoo. I mean, they can't miss it. They have to eat it. I mean, it's it's easy to come out. I, would, I love those. And there's things. a variety of courts out there. You have your deep, you know, like we talked about earlier, the four horsemen, the deep yeah. thud, the high pitch, and then you have your clip-ons and your quiet courts. So this is this is a real loud. It's got that that front 
and it's gonna make a big old commotion, like a boom, like a big redfish eating something. This is my redfish setup. This is a medium heavy spinning reel. So I can throw, I, I do not throw corks with a bait caster. It's just too many different access points on the throw. Uh, you have to kind of line it up perfectly. So this way I can throw it in the wind. Uh, I don't always have like a, a shrimp on there. It's just on that. Um, usually, mostly if I'm fishing for redfish, it's gonna be a super light jig head, like a, a 16 ounce with a gulp on it. Uh, you know, vary the depth of this. But I want a loud top, uh, popping cork, usually for redfish, unless it's like dead calm. Um, for my trout, I usually favor the more subtle sounding uh, top waters, like, or popping corks. Keep saying top water. But uh, this one, or the or the skinny version of this, is more like a cigar. It just kind of does a little slap, slap kind of sound versus a cool. Um, we have those foggy mornings or, or uh, those real still, quiet mornings or whatnot. And um, uh, if you're not getting bit on the top water and you go to a fork, um, that is the time when I want to use that little clip on and long leader. Just that little light presentation, and man, it pays off. Um, spoons are another good option if you're fishing in grass, and uh, you know you're, you're pulling. I like to when I throw a spoon, I like to stand up. It's like one of my favorite baits to sight cast with when I see reds in like a grassy area. You'll see like a lot of thick grass, and sometimes you'll see kind of an alley where those red fish have been running. So everything's kind of like higher in the water column and then except like one little spot and I'll try to pitch my spoon in there and I'll just kind of run it and they'll just kind of come out it's a lot of usually in those grassy areas it's a lot cleaner water that spoon makes some really nice shining uh, you know sight for them that they can see really far off and you'll see them kind of speed into it and hit them um, problem with spoons in my opinion uh, flip up ratio is sometimes a little bit bad uh, they make some different spoons that like where the hook is a little bit further back those tend to work a little bit better uh, the spoons the hooks break a lot of times when you're when you're pulling them out uh, fish so just kind of be careful when you're pulling them out uh, but definitely a great uh, sight sight fishing lure and especially uh, when those small shrimp show up in the marsh this time of year uh, the really tiny spoons are great if you can get away with a, a, a classic a treble hook on the back like a spray spoon, um, you eliminate the hookup problem pretty much. You're going to hook every one of them. Uh, but you're not always going to go to throw that. You're going to hook it on grass or, or the bottom or whatever. But any uh, uh, a classic. Um, this is what he's talking hook about. Is, uh, so this is. It's, uh, that's a, a wobble right. Excellent, excellent. This uh, is my nighttime fishing go to bait. Uh, I can't catch. Anything better than throwing this thing at night under the lights, Grand Isle, and uh, go into some camp lights. Different sizes these things come in. I mean, light, you get a light. These are shiny. Good hookup ratio with a treble hook. What more do you need? I mean, they're great. They're also great to bring to the beach if you guys ever go to, uh, you know, stay at. Uh, you know, Destin or something in the summer, and you want to catch some ladyfish or mackerel yeah. off the beach, you can hum these things, you know, 100 yards without getting your feet in the water and uh, just catch some really yeah, fun do fish. Yeah, every year. Gulf Shores, anywhere up in there, you know, you just walk out on the beach early in the morning. And, man, I've caught four or five species doing that. Catch a Spanish every now and then, you catch a bluefish, ladyfish, uh, it's, it's fun. Um, I usually keep a little gulp variety bucket like this in the kayak just for whenever I'm fishing for flounder, if I'm fishing for finicky trout. Uh, this is just kind of like a go-to kind of thing. Pressure cheap, but if you need to. This is my IFA bag that I keep for bull reds. So inside my IFA bag I have some of these. Pre-made with some big weights and another bag of really big jig heads, like cobia-sized jig heads. We used to talk about when we were doing the um, the IFA series and 
years ago, we say, man, who wants to catch a full whale? You know, that, but, you know we've just, uh, it, they've kind of grown on us. I mean, it's just a blast. Uh, we don't do it all the time, but when you get that opportunity to go out there and you find them, it is fun. So uh, it is something to, you can target them, and you can go uh, and get the biggest fish you ever caught in your life. <laughs> And especially a kid, you take a kid out there when it's right, you find them, and you get that pattern down, and you go out there, and it really gets you excited. The IFA, um, the IFA championship every year has become a big party. It's yeah. uh, everybody knows where the bull reds are. It's no secret. They're in Barrett Terry Pass, and you have to fish two events. If you're interested in this this year, come this weekend. We'll be out Sunday at Lafitte, the first tournament. You just have to fish one of them. You have to pay for two of them to fish the championship. But the championship is a two-day event. You get a measuring board, you catch bull reds. We all go out to Bear Terry Pass. There's literally like 40 of us. We're out there. We're like, I'm here, Steve's here. And just other, I mean, it's Doug's right here. I mean, we're all like within That's spinning distance. <laughs> and we're just casting and everybody's hooked up, just culling through giant redfish. And you're looking for that 45 inch board buster red but every single one of them is over 37. So it's really fun. You, you get to the point where you just like get a really beefy, crazy thick rod and you just like want to horse them in and I like got that one in in one minute. And <laughs> I mean, you're just going through these big bad boys quick. I got a trout limit, 25 bull reds. All of them were exactly freaking 39 to 40 inches. I just could not get one any bigger. So uh, that was probably the most I've caught in a day. It was probably 25. It was ridiculous. This is the other bait we use for bull reds, pinfish. It's uh, really loud. It goes deep. It makes a lot of noise and vibration. Um, this, this thing pulls through the water, gets noticed. Um, you, you, a lot of times you're out in the path and you see crabs going by. I, I would imagine this looks like a crab maybe, or looks like a fish to them, but they come and smash it. Uh, sometimes I'll throw this thing, it flutters at the top of the water column. It really looks like a crab to me, and uh, this has saved my butt uh, a couple of times when I've had just <clears throat> no tide, the bulls aren't biting. I go to a place and I'm just kind of slow rolling it on the top and like the tide whenever the tide shuts down those bulls like they come up to the top of the water and they start looking for like what's still hanging out and I've crushed them when the crabs are like just floating by just swimming kind of yeah and you just something like a like a spinner bait blade or, or that spoon doesn't go too deep and they'll just come up and nail it and get yourself a, a fight on your hands all right, well, you want to get to our uh, yeah. wrap-up? Uh, so our last section, any, any questions on tackle? Anybody have any questions yeah. on tackle? Sorry, this probably went over. Well, you guys were, were talking about throwing a lot of light baits, and, you know, I think most of us, I, 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 until recently, I was very guilty of it. Uh, I want a medium-heavy rod, you know, um, and I found that uh, when I went to medium action, I was throwing a lot further and I was catching a lot. So that, that is a medium and then this is a medium light. Yeah, and I, never, I haven't gone that far. <laughs> so, so when it comes to... Uh, really whippy. Yeah. yeah, when it comes to spin and tackle, excellent for, uh, for just about everyone. Um, most people have no problem using spin and tackle, but if you don't, if you're not familiar with it, you don't use it a lot, another advantage too is that I can switch up. So I'm chunking, 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 I'm reeling, reeling up. I'm working my primary, my dominant arm. So most people are going to throw a spin and rod with a dominant arm. I can really crank it out there and uh, get a lot of distance, working it, working it. Popping course especially is pop all day long. Then I get tired, I put this down, put my bait caster on. I can still cast right or left, but then a prime, most people primarily reel with the right hand on your bait caster. So then you're going to go back to working a jerk bait or a top water, 
with, and then you're working this arm. So switching up using both does help with fatigue level, and that's a tournament strategy in my opinion, is not to let yourself get too wore out physically uh, by traveling too far, by using your arms in a manner where now you're starting to fish crappy, you're, you're not giving it all. If you switch up and have variety in your tackle, it will help. Yeah, especially if you just got off the water hoisting up 25 bull reds and you still need to go get that trout. You, uh, <laughs> this one might be a little bit worn, so you might want to be throwing that big ass. <laughs> what, what, got, I guess, changed my, my mentality on that is very honest. I threw the wrong rod in my bag after a crankbait rod. Which was right, medium, right. medium weight, right. you know. As it's a moderate action, so it bends throughout yeah. the whole run. And I hooked up a whole lot better. Right. And I was thinking. Rule some, of thumb is this, better, you know. That, that might help. Trouble hook lures, you're going to keep them buttoned up typically better, especially a small trouble hook lure. You're going to keep them buttoned up better with more moderate at bend or a lighter action rod than you will with a heavier action rod. Jig head fish, if you hook them with at one single hook, once you hook them, uh, you can get away with a faster action rod and get them in. You see people fishing the bridges at Hunch Train and they just hook them, just boom, right in. Try that with a trouble hook and guarantee you don't lose half of those. So rod can dictate, or your lures can dictate what type of rod you're gonna throw. Fast out. action rod with top waters, you wanna, you wanna set that hook braided line as like a must. I mean, if you you lose, you know, that's like the number one thing. You'll be able to set the hook on that fish way faster with braided line. Yes. Um, you don't want that rubber band going boing. Right. I mean, we're. I mean, uh, I've measured it out before. We're making easy hundred foot cast at times. You get a nice wind blown cast. I'm dumping the spool. You know, if I had mono on there and I pulled back three feet, I guarantee the lure doesn't move one foot. But if I have braid and I pull back three feet, the lure is coming three feet. So you have no stretch and you can get that long cast hook up and you can get it in. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. We'll hit it at the end. Um, Eli, you want to move on to our next section? This will be a quick section. We'll blast through this. Now, what we're doing here is putting it all together. Oops, sorry. Let's put all the stuff together. All right. Uh, there you go. Um, strategy for success. Talk about all these different things. All right, uh, travel time, and now this is kind of a review, and now you can kind of see where some of this is coming from. Early bite, fish soon. So look at your weather, look at your barometer, see where it's going throughout the day. Look at your storms, are they coming in? Do you want to fish early? Do you want to travel early? Maybe in the winter you want to travel early, fish late. Uh, late bite, travel uh, first. Uh, going the distance is not always better. Do I want to spend all day traveling and fish less, or is it the right is it the right move? Do I have a certain little rock pile that I just gotta get to, and that's where the big fish are? So that's a consideration. You travel more and go far or less. Uh, travel on a slack tide. When you travel, it is beneficial to look at your tide chart and travel when that water is dead. And uh, that's when you want to eat, you can travel, you can load your kayak up and move to another spot unless it's a blast off uh, type of turn. Uh, Multi-species lures, a lot of the stuff that we showed you here, uh, some of it is, is specific, but multi-species lures, you have your little uh, jerk baits, your top waters, um, uh, you have uh, spinner baits can actually be a great multi-species lure. Now, how you kind of change it is use more natural presentation for everything. But say it's dark and cloudy or whatever, you're just going for redfish. Maybe you want to go for that that morning glory, that dark color with chartreuse tail. You get you know maybe a little dirty water. Uh, but that's how you can move it from a multi-species to a specific bait is with color. Uh, where you're throwing it. And then all your plastics over here, very multi-species. I mean, you can take a little gulp curly tail and catch everything out that swims. Uh, specific lures, and this is where we narrow it down, more natural colors uh, versus on the top would be more trout, and then we have more redfish stuff here in the middle. 
We're getting more specific. We're dialing it in to our species a little bit more. And then we have uh, maybe some flounder stuff down here in the bottom. Okay, you can catch flounder on your stick baits, uh, your, your uh, plastics. Uh, those are excellent because a lot of times your flounder, say in the channel, you go to the ship channel, you're fishing 10, 12 foot down. Uh, sometimes you're fishing on the shallower areas, but when you do have to drop off, those straight tail lures will go straight down, get to your fish, and they'll want to stand up on that bottom, move them along, then they'll stand up again, those flounder will come up behind it. And so uh, uh, specific lures versus multi-species, make that decision, that'll help you out in your tournament strategy. Uh, organization, versatility, we talked about spinning rods and bait casters. Learn, use both, uh, cast right-handed, left-handed, all of that helps in uh, versatility. Uh, plan your route. When you're planning your route, one of the important things is uh, uh, make pass-by stuff near enough that you're always giving yourself more opportunity. I'm not gonna go way out here in the bay if I'm trying to go from spot A to spot B. I'm gonna zip right along those corners and right along all that good stuff. Or I may go around something. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen, oh man, there's something blowing up right there. I didn't even know that was there. Cast over, boom, that's the fish I was looking for. So plan your route so that you maximize and pass by good fishable water. Don't spend 30, 45 minutes at just crossing some random spot and you have no chance of catching anything. Uh, what works for me? Um, beside when to travel, travel in productive waters, um, decide if I'm going species specific. So am I gonna go for the lightest, most uh, perfect trout lure, or am I gonna put a lure on that maybe can catch kind of everything? So I'm gonna make that decision. And sometimes I do wanna go very species specific, especially for redfish. Um, you know, a lot of people use the little crawfish now with the, uh, you know, the belly weighted hook, like we showed the belly weighted hooks are great. I'm not gonna throw that crawfish for a trout. I'm gonna throw it for redfish only. But if I'm in water that I'm not really sure what's there, you know, if I just throw a plain Jane plastic paddle tail, you know, I might catch everything on it. So you make those decisions. And you also want to decide what you're gonna be comfortable with accepting if it's a tournament. So if you all of a sudden caught a trout and before the, tr the tournament started, you said, well, once I get an 18 inch trout, I'm gonna be happy with that. You know, you catch that 18 inch trout, you know not to spend any more time with that species because you're probably gonna be, you know, catching smaller fish than that, so you might as well work on upgrading other species. Um, fish the whole water column, something that was working the hour before, now it's kind of fading. You know, changing that presentation and going to a different water column can make all the difference. You want to, if you go top, middle, bottom, you might find that the, the fish are still there in an area. Now they've changed to a different level. So fishing the whole water column, don't just blast through with one lure. Um, going through with a jig, oh, they're not biting. No, throw something else. Uh, give a good spot a follow-up cast. You throw a lure in, you get a blow up on a top water, like Brendan said, he throws a, a follow-up lure that's subsurface just below, and boom, that triggered him. I don't like to just blast and blast and blast the same lure, in a, especially if I just missed a fish. One of my uh, favorite techniques is to have three presentations rigged up. I, I make five casts, get a bump put it up, pick something else up, throw it, and then just keep doing the merry-go-round. Keep switching and running through that tackle if I know there's a fish there. And uh, catch one or two on this, then they'll quit. You make 10 casts, nothing, switch. Boom, the very first next cast, I've just caught one, and you just keep doing that merry-go-round and you'll, uh, you'll have more success. If you find a place like that that has a, a fish that gives you a bite that you don't hook up, uh, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll circle back, let it rest, give about 15 minutes, come back, and throw, throw that same exact presentation if it, they weren't taking any of the follow-ups and that fish has repositioned himself and he's ready to eat this time. Because like, if, I don't know if you guys have fish aquariums at home and you look at your fish and they always want to hang out in one little spot. When you start feeding them, they start moving around. 
But after a while, they settle back down in that same spot. It's kind of like when you're fishing. You throw, throw that top water, boom, he comes out and he's swimming all around. After about 15 minutes, he settled back in his little hole. You come back around, you let it rest. <laughs> Got it. All right. So uh, I hope this information helps. And uh, one more slide, Eli. Oh, next one. This was Sweden this year, brother. On, <laughs> on to give uh, uh, recognition to uh, the Scott this year, Scott and I won the Bayou Coast and the Lafayette Club Angler of the Year. Scott couldn't be with us. He has his back surgery. And, uh, you know, Scott's helped so many of us over the years. And Scott actually asked us for stuff, and now we're asking him. So uh, we can all teach each other stuff, and I uh, hope he gets better with his back. His surgery went good, so uh, you guys should see him for sure. All right. Thanks well, for coming out, guys.